With about 1.6 billion adherents, Islam is the second largest religion on earth. Yet its followers represent less than 1% of the world's scientists. Only a handful of people from Muslim majority countries have won Nobel Prizes in science. However, up until the Mongol siege of Baghdad in 1258, Islamic science was the most advanced in the world. In comparison with the past, the modern disparity is staggering. Thus, to understand the present-day lack of scientific accomplishments, we must explore the past. In this first installment of a new series, we will go over the rise and decline of Islamic attitudes towards science. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. If you want to support more original content like this, visit patreon.com slash Report for more information. In pre-Islamic times, merchants from Africa, Asia and Europe traded along ancient routes and exchanged goods for coins, materials and other products. The most valuable commodity was silk. It was so precious that it was often used as an exchange currency. Silk was a luxurious item that universally represented power and wealth. It was so valuable that the world's largest trading route was named after it. The Romans and Persians had explored the Silk Road and constructed the required infrastructure to support and facilitate the incoming trade. However, since both sides had been preoccupied with war and conflict, the full potential of the Silk Road never materialized. In the 8th century, the Abbasid dynasty overthrew the Umayyad nobility and inherited the Roman and Persian empires. Just like that, the Arabs came in possession of an empire that stretched from the Iberian Peninsula to the fringes of China and India. The absence of old political barriers enabled commodities and ideas of former civilizations to spread and interact with each other. As caravans traveled along the Silk Road, they exchanged Egyptian glass, Persian saffron powder, Turkoman stallions, Tamil steel, Chinese lacquerware and porcelains, and much more. At the heart of the Silk Road was the Abbasid Empire, meaning if the Romans wanted to import Gujarati sandalwood or Nubian slaves, they had to travel along the Abbasid checkpoints. To cope with the surge in commerce, the Abbasids founded new centers of trade. Cities along the Silk Road flourished, such as Balkh, Samarkand, Tabriz, and more. It is in this era of history that the lavishly wealthy and diverse city of Merv became known as the Mother of Earth. Meanwhile, its competitor, Rey, nowadays located within Tehran, was referred to as the Gate of Commerce. Yet perhaps the city that stood out most was Baghdad. Al-Mansur, the second caliph of the Abbasid Empire, had built the city at the site where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were at their narrowest crossings. It was such a success that the caliph proclaimed Baghdad as his capital instead of Damascus. On that account, the new capital grew into a metropolitan center with parks, bathhouses, bazaars, mosques, schools, courts, forums and even hospitals. Public life in the city was surging. By the end of the 10th century, Baghdad would become the largest city on earth. As cities flourished in private enterprises, a hunger for knowledge, fine craftsmanship and exotic foods surged throughout the Abbasid realm. It was one of the earliest forms of globalization. People wanted to wear new clothes taste different foods and display exotic items. One of these exotic commodities was Chinese paper, which proved to be exceedingly useful for the vast Abbasid imperial bureaucracy. So the rulers set up paper mills in cities such as Basra, Alexandria and Baghdad. And over time, writing materials became more affordable and more available. Subsequently, the availability of paper encouraged record keeping, banking, poetry and even scholarship. As literacy increased and books became a common item, it was no longer required to conduct manual labor to ensure a livelihood. Scholars could make a wealthy living by writing new ideas and books. As a result, an intellectual revolution ignited and the market for information surged. Since the Abbasids had started out as a Persian nationalist revolt, 
the dynasty shared many of the Sassanid traditions, including maintaining a vast imperial library. Thus, the availability of cheap paper contributed to the expansion of the imperial library of El Rashid. The Khalif employed scholars to translate Greek, Chinese, Sanskrit and Persian works in the field of physics, chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, geography and other faculties into Arabic. Advances in technology helped to solve everyday problems. For instance, the study of astronomy and trigonometry helped to determine the direction to Mecca the times for prayer, etc. Technological process also improved engineering techniques and even sparked an agrarian revolution. As scholars worked tirelessly to translate every available scientific text, the Abbasids, without even realizing it, had successfully globalized knowledge. Eventually, this massive undertaking would become known as the Translation Movement and it established Arabic as a scientific language of antiquity. As the movement gained momentum, the Abbasid Empire, which was already known as a military, economic and cultural powerhouse, also became an intellectual haven. To that end, ambitious scholars who sought peace and stability for their research immigrated to the Islamic world. One such family was the Barmakids dynasty from Balkh. The household of Buddhist origins became known for their patronage of physicians and the study of medicine. Another dynasty was the Buktishu, a Christian family of surgeons who helped translate the Zoroastrian and Sassanid studies. Either way from Italy and Scandinavia to China and India. If you wanted to pursue science, the Abbasid Empire was the place to be. The quest for scientific achievements accelerated during the reign of El Mamnun, the seventh Abbasid ruler. He converted Baghdad's imperial library into the house of wisdom and thus established a formal institution of learning. He also placed the physician Ibn Ishaq in charge of the translation of foreign scripts. Ibn Ishaq was such an accomplished translator of Greek knowledge that he is often referred to as the Sheikh of translators. In any case, the House of Wisdom was the most ambitious educational undertaking since the foundation of the Library of Alexandria. It was the Silicon Valley of the Abbasids, and it ushered in the Islamic Golden Age. As time passed, more state-funded centers of learning or madrasas were established in the realm. Cities such as Nishapur, Bukhara and Kabul became centers of learning. With the right people in charge, the accumulation of knowledge flourished. Some of the great minds of this era include al khwarizmi who combined the works of Greek and Indian scholars and made enormous contributions to the algebraic method, and Ibn Hayyan, who made his renowned accomplishments to alchemy and strongly influenced the course of European chemistry. This was also the era of El Tabari, who wrote the historical chronicle of the history of prophets and kings, which serves as a crucial source for the history of the Middle East. Other important figures from this era include the Banu Musa brothers, who made mechanical devices and worked on the foundation of geometry. Women too surged in the sciences. Take Al Fihri, Al Astrolabi, Lubna of Cordoba, and Al Mahan Li, who all exceeded in mathematics. In any case, as the Abbasids came in contact with Greek philosophy, Indian numeral system, Persian rule of law, and other Chinese and Roman studies, the scholars became genuine students of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Ptolemy, Brahmagupta, Sushruta, and others. It wasn't long before Persian and Arab scholars adapted foreign ideas and improved on those concepts. One example was the assimilation of Neoplatonic philosophy and Aristotelian metaphysics in the Islamic context by al kinda who is unanimously hailed as the father of Arabic philosophy. The translation movement is mostly lost in the modern educational curriculum, but it's an acknowledgement that the receptiveness of the Muslim rulers and scholars to foreign ideas was the primary catalyst that paved the way for the Islamic Golden Age. As the assimilation of knowledge ignited a trend towards 
Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism, a new collective of scholars emerged. Its students were known as the Mutazilites, and their doctrine was mostly based on ancient Greek philosophy but adjusted within Islamic context. A prime contention of the Mutazila belief was that the metaphysical world, which includes objects and properties, space and time, cause and effect, could be used to understand not just the physical world, but also the nature of God and creation. In other words, its members were united in their conviction that it was necessary to give a rationally coherent account of Islamic beliefs. What's more is that the group did not necessarily use the Quran and the Sunnah as the only sources of understanding. They believed that human existence was not predetermined and that humankind made decisions independently of God's will. As such, the Mutazilites believed in absolute free will. Nowadays it is difficult to imagine this because the modern situation differs so greatly from the past. However, at the time, rational Mutazilism was the universal doctrine of the Muslim communities. In fact, the Mutazila creed was so appreciated that the Abbasid rulers formally enforced it. But it is easy to get away with the glory of the past. The truth is, the Islamic Golden Age was a time of prosperity and growing divisions. Rebellions broke out in Persia and North Africa. It was a time in which minorities such as Christians, Jews and Shia Muslims were treated with tolerance and at times repressed. It was an era in which the global economy prospered due to the slave trade as well as the Silk Road. At the time, human trafficking was endorsed by every civilization on earth. The Turks were a group of people that were particularly in demand in the slave markets. Originally from Central Asia, the Turkish people were valued for their intelligence and bravery. In sequence with their archery and horsemanship traditions, it made them superb soldiers and diplomats. For their valuable skills, the Turks were enslaved transported to the Middle East and placed in the royal courts and armies of the Abbasid Empire. While the scholars were busy assimilating knowledge, Turkish mercenaries, often referred to as Mamluks, had climbed the ranks of the Abbasid army. By the 9th century, some Turkish Mamluks commanded entire armies, while others were entrusted bodyguards for local rulers and dynasties. It would not take long for the Turks to realize that they could just seize power for themselves. But this and more we will explain in the second episode in the rise and decline of Islamic attitudes towards science. This was a Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. I want to thank our contributors on Patreon for their support. YouTube doesn't monetize sensitive topics and videos, so it really is Patreon that allows us to continue our research and work. And if you want to be a part of that progress, visit patreon.com slash Report for more information. Anyway, thank you for watching and so